Okay. Look, um, it's an absolute delight to come down here. Uh, my name's Charles Jenkins and um, I'm a doctor at Fiona Stanley and I'm an advanced trainee in cardiac surgery. Um, and more importantly, uh, only nine years ago, I was actually sitting in the, in the chairs that you were sitting in. Um, so it's actually really exciting to be down here and uh, hopefully I won't bore you too much because the topic's actually quite interesting. Um, I think so anyway. So um, I'm going to try and break it down as best I can. And um, I will start off with some learning outcomes because this is really what you need to know from the exam. But on this slide, the most important thing is down the bottom. So this is a visual presentation. And just after you leave this lecture theatre, there's a full set of notes that basically cover everything that we'll be going through. They'll actually go up onto your website. So, you know, feel free not to take too many notes because I promise you that everything you need to know is actually going to be there and it's better than opening up a textbook. Just some revisions to get us started with. And again, this is to try and help you with your exams. When you talk about the chest, and I'm hoping that you've actually had a chance to learn and read about the mediastinum, it really helps to have a reference point. And the same goes for every single level of the body. So in the chest, the key is T4. So if I ask you, any one of you a question, at what level does this happen? Probably the answer is T4. Okay, so that's really useful. And a lot of interesting stuff happens at this level. So this level goes from the vertical disc between T4 and T5 right the way through to the sternal angle, or otherwise known as the angle of Louis. And this is something that's called the transverse thoracic plane, and it's got an eponymous name of Ludwig. And it's really interesting because all of these fascinating things happen, and we won't have time to go through all of these today, but they're really easy to remember because you put them out and they spell claptrap. I didn't come up with this, but it's actually a really useful thing to know. So again, if I ask you, at what level does this occur? The answer is probably T4. So for mediastinum, just revision from foundations, it's Latin for middle septum. And it's the space in between the two pulmonary cavities, lined by the pleura of the mediastinum, and it contains all the thoracic viscera except the lungs. So it contains the heart, the blood vessels, the nerves, the esophagus, the trachea, the thoracic duct and other things. And again, its key landmark is T4. Now, the mediastinum is not a fixed structure. It's mobile because you've got the lungs going in and out either side. You have the heart beating around and you also have the esophagus behind of it, which is actually taking food. So the mediastinum is not fixed. Now, just for the sake of convenience, we divide it up into the superior and inferior mediastinum, and who can tell me what the landmark for superior and inferior is? T4, absolutely. So above T4, it's superior, below it's inferior, and then we divide the inferior mediastinum into three compartments based upon the pericardium. So if it's inside the pericardium, then it's the middle mediastinum. If it's anterior, then it's anterior mediastinum. If it's posterior, it's the posterior mediastinum. I'm not going to go through this slide. This is really just to help you with your exams. And again, this will actually be in the notes that I've asked them to upload after this lecture. Uh, but these are the contents of the various compartments, but I'm going to give you a hot little tip for how to remember the posterior mediastinum. And the way you do is that it's got birds, and there are four of them. So, in the posterior mediastinum, now this slide is not actually in the notes, if you want to photograph this at the end, feel free. There is a vague goose. <laughs> There's an esophagus goose. There's an azygous, and there's a thoracic duck. <laughs> <laughs> now, the only problem with this, apart from being a terrible dad joke, is that it forgets the descending aorta. Now, I can't actually think of a bird that rhymes with descending aorta, so if anyone here has it, I'll put it on next year's and you'll get credit. But I didn't make this up. I don't have any original ideas in my head. 
but that's how you remember the structures of the posterior medial spine. Going through the basics of cardiovascular physiology, in essence, it's a continuous pipe of, of veins and arteries with two pumps creating two circuits in series. So you have the heart up here, the right and the left side in series, and they have priming chambers, which we call atria, and they have pumping chambers we call ventricles. So on the pumping chambers, there are valves on the inlet and the outflow side. And that way, blood continues going through the vascular bed in a forward direction. Okay? On the right side, you have deoxygenated blood going to the lungs, returning oxygenated to the left side, being pumped through to the body. And this slide just shows roughly what percentage of blood goes to where. And so this is a very nice slide that, again, I took from somewhere else, um, that shows it more in a schematic way. So when you have deoxygenated blood coming back to the heart, it comes through the inlet valve, out the outflow valve of the right heart, to the lungs, it then returns oxygenated to the left atrium, the priming chamber of the left heart, goes through the inlet valve, gets pumped around the body, going through the outflow valve, which then stops the blood from rushing back in. If you understand that, you're on your way to understanding cardiovascular physiology. But this is a, this is a lecture on anatomy. And so first of all, we have to talk about some features of the heart. So to orient us, what we'll do is we'll talk about where the heart lies in the chest and what its major features are. So let's start off with the apex. So the apex is this little bit down here. And it's anterior and to the left, it's where you get the apex beam on the stethoscope, although it's not quite there, but that's for another day. Um, and it's mainly left ventricle, mainly the muscle mass of left ventricle, which is the little bit of right ventricle in there as well. And if you want to call the heart borders, you have an inferior border and a left border, and so the apex is a, the apex of the left and the inferior border. Come across to the base. Now the base of the heart, which is here, is a posterior structure, and it's to the right of the midline. <coughs> and it's largely left atrium, with just a tiny bit of right atrium, and then this little structure down here we're going to revisit called the coronary sinus, but that's the base of the heart. So the heart actually sits forward. It doesn't hang down like we sometimes try and visualise. The heart actually sits forward, pointing to the left. The base being to the right and posterior, the apex being to the left and anterior. Now it has borders. So you have the right border of the heart, which is down here, is mainly your right atrium. And, it's, and you can see it's a little oracle or appendage. But the right atrium forms the right border of the heart. The left ventricle forms the left border of the heart, and you can see the left oracle just peeking up over the horizon there. And then on this inferior border down here, it's mainly right ventricle. Okay, And then just a small portion of the left ventricle as you get out towards the apex. And it doesn't really have a superior border. Well, I mean, it does, but it's bad at the time because it's just these vessels that are swinging around inside the pericardial space. And then you have some surfaces. So it has an anterior or a sternocostal surface. So that's the bit that's sitting in the front of the chest. And that is largely right ventricle. So the right ventricle is anterior. It's not to the right, it's anterior. And what do you reckon the opposite of that is? left ventricle is posterior, correct. So the reason for this is because back in the day when the old anatomists were naming these things in Greek and Latin, they used to pick a heart up, just as you would in the anatomy lab. They say, oh yeah, right to left. But in actual fact, the right ventricle is an anterior structure, the left ventricle is a posterior structure. So there's the anterior surface, mainly RV with a little bit of LV. Here's the posterior surface, mainly LV with a little bit of RV. Now, at the very bottom, there's an inferior surface, 
on the diaphragm, which has a little bit of the right atrium and the IVC going through the inferior vena cava, but the inferior vena cava does not run in the pericardium. Okay? So the inferior vena cava is actually blended with the diaphragm. And then as the heart sits on the diaphragm, you have your LV and your RV forming the bits of it. Now this is dead simple, and I'm sure you probably already know this already, but if you want to trace out the surface markings of the heart, and this is important if you have chest trauma, it runs from the third possible cartilage down to the sixth in this nice curved line defining the right border of the heart, scoops across to the fifth intercostal space, lateral to the, to the midclavicular line, about nine centimetres from the sternum, then zips up over there, um, and into the second intercostal space, the second costal cartilage, in that nice curved silhouette, and then back down to where you started. And those are the surface markings of the heart. So the pericardium, two components, fibrous and serous, and they both form very different functions. So the fibrous pericardium is a tough external layer and it provides the rigidity and it stops the heart from blowing apart and it actually helps it to pump. And it sits around the roots of the great vessels, so your, uh, your cavity, your aorta, your pulmonary artery, your veins, except your IVC, because remember we said that that's actually inseparably blended with the diaphragm. And it basically goes all the way around the heart to provide strength. So it blends with the tunica adventitia of the great vessel superiorly. And what level does it do this at? T4, fantastic. And it's actually carried up by the aorta at that level to the sternal angle. And then in front of it, there are very weak sternopericardial ligaments that actually attach the pericardium to the front of the sternum. Now in cardiac surgery, we divide these all the time because we split the sternum and then they just fall apart and you're left with the pericardium underneath. The serous pericardium is very different. <coughs> so this is just a layer of serosa. They're made of a single layer of mesothelial cells that sit on the inside of the fibrous pericardium, go right the way around, reflect off the vessels, and they actually line the heart. And like any serous membrane that you can think of in the body, the function of this is for lubrication. So it creates a potential space and there's a small volume of fluid that allows the heart to move around in a friction-reduced environment. So, now we get to the good stuff. Let's go inside the heart. Now, we mentioned on this slide before that you have inflow with an inflow valve and outflow with an outlet valve. And that pumps around the body and it prevents it from coming back. <coughs> So they're made of thin little strips of connective tissue forming cusps. And as you can see over here, all the valves more or less lie in one plane. I mean, again, we're used to thinking of this where some valves are a bit lower, some valves are a little bit higher. But if you section the heart, it's actually possible to more or less get all the valves in the one plane. So it's not quite what we'd expect. And then you have this little structure here, which is very important, and perhaps people don't take enough notice of it. It's called the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So I've drawn it in red. Now this diagram um, I took from a paper that's it's not entirely accurate. These two valves should be a little bit closer together. Um, and then you have this figure of eight in, in continuity with each other called the fibrous skeleton. And this forms a basis for the muscles to actually hang off as they form the muscle of the heart. So your ventricles hang off the skeleton down, your atria hang upwards, and there are no muscle fibres in a normal heart that go across this, this fibrous skeleton. And it's got another really important function, and can anyone tell me what that is? I, he I heard it. It's an insulator. It actually stops electrical action potentials from crossing over from the atria to the ventricles outside of what they're supposed to do. So let's talk about the AV valves or the atrioventricular valves. And there are two. There's the mitral and the tricuspid. We'll talk about the tricuspid first. 
So this is on the right side, so the deoxygenated side, this is the tricuspid valve here. And it's got three cusps, and it will admit the tips of three fingers in your heart. So your tricuspid valve, assuming you have a normal heart, will take three of your fingers. And that's in, in opposition to the mitral valve, which has how many cusps? Two. And how many fingers will it take? Two. See? It's easy. So the tricuspid valve is what guards the, uh, the atrioventricular orifice of the right heart. And it's got three cusps. Anterior, posterior, and septal. That's the anterior cusp there, that's the posterior there, and then you've got the septal coming in there. Okay? Now, it's flat, it goes down, and at its free edge, it takes cords. Okay? Now, these cords, cordy tendinii, then attach down onto a papillary muscle. And what they do is they actually prevent the leaflets of the tricuspid valve from blowing back up into the, into the atrium and causing it to leak. So if you lose your cords, your valve is going to leak. The other thing they do is they actually make the cusps come together and touch. Whoops, lost my battery. Sorry. They make the cusps touch and increase the area of coaptation so they actually make the valve seal properly. And the other thing, just like the pericardium, they stop the ventricle from dilating and expanding, so they actually help the heart function more efficiently. So the cords aren't just simple structures. The papillary muscles are not just simple structures that stop prolapse of the valve. They actually have a really important role to play in the heart. Now let's go across to the mitral. And the mitral guards the left side of the AV orifice. And as we say, it's got two cusps. It admits two fingers. And it also has this free edge attached to these cordy tendini down onto the papillary muscles. <coughs> it's got an anterior leaflet and a posterior leaflet. So you can see that the anterior leaflet is actually smaller on the annulus than the posterior leaflet, but its area is actually larger. So now going to the ventricular arterial valve, so your aortic and your pulmonary. We'll have a look at the pulmonary valve, which is this one here. So just as the mitral and the tricuspid valves are very similar, the pulmonary and the aortic valves are also quite similar. So these are what we call semi-lunar valves, because apparently some anatomist said that that little thing there looks like a moon. I'm still trying to see it. Uh, but effectively they're little cup-shaped cusps, and they lie edge to edge in that Mercedes Benz side, and they're convex towards the ventricles. And then above them, the artery dilates a little, and so that way when they open and they spread towards the wall, they won't actually obstruct the coronary arteries on the aortic valve, and also they form little vortices. So it's very, very clever engineering, because those vortices with that little swelling on the side actually help them close, and we'll see that in a moment. So the pulmonary valve has left, right and anterior cusps, so this is your left cusp here, this is your right cusp here, this is your anterior. Now um, keep in mind that this is sort of looking from head down, which is kind of an odd anatomical position, but it's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice picture. Then coming towards the aortic valve. So this is your aortic valve, it's semi-lunar, it has three cusps, but you never call this valve tricuspid because you confuse yourself with the tricuspid valve of the right atrium and ventricle. And you can see that you've got these dilatations above, and then that's where it attaches. You can see that it's actually crown-shaped, if you kind of use your imagination. It's shaped like a crown. And in these little sinuses, they're called the sinus of Valsava, you have the ostia of your coronary arteries, your right and your left, and that's how you name them. So this is your right coronary cusp, this is your left coronary cusp, and this is your non-coronary cusp. Now, I'm going to give you a hot exam tip here. If you have to study one thing for the inside of the heart, what are you going to study? The right atrium. So the right atrium is really anatomically interesting. The left atrium, as you can see, 
over here is pretty bland. It's just got a couple little depressions and that's it. Have a look how much stuff is going on here. You've got inlets, you've got the fossa, you've got valves, you've got a lot. So the right atrium is what you're probably going to be examined on. Okay, it's a favourite question in rhythms, it's a favourite question in vibers because there's so much interesting anatomy. The right atrium lies between the superior vena cava up here, the inferior vena cava down here, and then at its lower end, pretty much the whole lot is tricuspid valve. And above it, you've got the oracle of the right atrium. You can see how it's all rich and it's got these pectinate muscles, these fine muscles. Embryology. It always comes back to bite you. This is the remnant of the primitive atrium of the embryo. And then as it transitions, there's a compressed of, of muscle that comes up and over. You can see it's smooth on this side, it's rough on this side. So smooth zone, rough zone, and this is called the crista terminalis, or the terminal crest. Then just over here between, just alongside to the left of the IVC, you've got the coronary sinus, and we will come back and forth about this later on. This is where the venous drainage of most of the heart re-enters the heart. The coronary sinus, how big is it? It's as big as your little finger. So your heart's coronary sinus should be as big as your little finger. The left atrium, as I say, it's pretty boring otherwise. Um, it's got, you know, it lies behind the right atrium, remember it's a posterior structure, and it's anterior to the, the esophagus, which is clinically very important because a lot of our imaging of the heart we actually do through the esophagus with ultrasound. And it has a small oracle, which we saw before, but it's just over here, and it peeks around the corner of the heart, and then it passes over the atrioventricular groove, this little area between the atria that we'll keep on seeing again and again and again. You've got one on both sides, and it's just full of fat and coronary vessels. Now, again, the oracle of the left atrium, embryology. It's a remnant of the primitive atrium. And it's enclosed and so as you get to the back wall, you've got your pulmonary veins, and you can see there are some, so there's your right superior, right inferior, you can see the left superior, left inferior, just over there behind. There are four of them, they're symmetrically spaced, and they're covered with serous pericardium. So as I say, left atrium is actually pretty boring. Then we get to the interatrial septum. So this is the posterior wall of the right atrium, and that makes it the what wall of the left atrium? Anterior, fantastic. So remember, atrium, left, behind, right, in front. And it's just above the coronary sinus, which we saw over here. So here's the septum just in there. And so what you see is you see this sort of dish-shaped depression called the fossa ovalis, and this is an embryological remnant of the primary septum of the fetus. And then you see this crescenteric shaped structure over here called the limbus. The limbus of the fossa ovalis, and that's the remnants of the secondary septum. Failure of those to close is what gives you a patent foramen ovale. So important clinical anatomy. Again, have a look. Really well defined in your right atrium, really poorly defined in your left. So if you're going to get asked a question, it's going to be on the right atrium. So now we get to our ventricles and you have these muscular ridges. We'll start off with the, um, with the uh, right ventricle. So this one is projecting to the left of the right atrium. The atrioventricular groove running vertically at its front, containing the right coronary artery, and you can see that just there. See, there's your, there's your right atrium, there's your right ventricle, so it's to the left. This runs vertically into the right coronary artery. And the muscle's thicker thicker than the atrial wall. So the atria is quite thin, it's almost paper thin in, in 80 year olds. Much thicker, and it's got these ridges called trabeculae carnii. And then these break free to form capillary muscles. It's really easy to remember. Tricuspid valve has anterior, posterior, and septal leaflets. So what do you reckon the capillary muscles are called? Anterior, posterior, and septal really easy to remember. Then, 
as it heads out, coming down to this diagram here, you have this thin walled portion, this is called the conus or the infundibulum, it's kind of cone shaped. And then on top of that, you've got a ring of fibrous tissue, and there's your pulmonary valve there. So the blood flows over this smooth walled section and out. And anterior to this, so this is the right ventricle here. You can see that again it's presenteric shaped. You can see that the septum between the ventricles pushes in. So the left ventricle is circular. You've got this sort of banana shape or crescent shaped right ventricle. So the left ventricle, as we say, is circular. It's three times as thick as the right ventricle in a normal heart. So it's generating much higher pressures. Remember, your left side of pressures are much higher than your right side of pressures. And it's got these well-developed kind of non-primitive trabecular carnia. You can see these, they're much more primitive. And you can see that there's this smooth portion as you start to get towards the outflow tract of the left ventricle. So this is where the blood will go. That's the aortic valve up there. So there are some husks. Okay. This will be your right coronary cusp here. This will be your non coronary cusp just here. And again, it has capillary muscles. Now, I said the anterior leaflet has anterior, uh, sorry, the mitral valve has an anterior and a posterior leaflet. What do you think the capillary muscles of the old me are called? Absolutely, anterior and po posterior. So the septum basically runs side to side. Again, right ventricle anterior, left ventricle posterior. So the septum goes side to side. And when you actually see the difference between them, so you can see that you get to this area here, which is the interventricular grooves. There's, there's a posterior and an anterior interventricular groove. They are marked by coronary arteries. Conduction system, two main components, sine atrial node in the, in the upper part of the right atrium, it's the junction of the right atrium and the SVC, and then basically everything else. So your AV node, including you know, then going down to your AV bundle of this, it was a common stain, right and left bundle branches, and the subendocardial of the pinchy fibres. So these things are designed to pierce the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So there is only one way in a normal heart that electrical con contraction can actually be propagated. Now, these are cardiac cells. They're not nerve cells. You'd expect everywhere else in the body, any time you need to actually con conduct something, it's nerves that do it. In the heart, these are specialised muscle cells. So the AV node is very deep in the interventricular septum. It runs through this membranous part of the septum prior to running the walls of, of the septum down and then getting off these pinky fibres. And the idea of that is that you want to activate the heart in a way that causes it to contract nicely and efficiently, and that's what it does. So this is probably the most important part of this topic. So the coronary arteries are the first branch of the descending aorta, ascending aorta, and there are two of them which then branch. So from previous study, you should know that the aorta has three parts, ascending, arch, and descending. And so if someone says, what are the first branches of the aorta? The answer is the left and the right coronary arteries. So they arrive from the left and right sinuses of valsava near the aortic valve, as we discussed before. And then they're actually hidden. So they're hidden by the right atrial appendage or the right atrial auricle and the pulmonary artery. And then a peak, that's the right coronary artery there. And then the left one peaks out from behind the pulmonary artery and then has the auricle of the left atrium across there. So the right coronary artery arises from the right aortic sinus. You can see there's another diagram of it there. And it passes between the right auricle and infundibulum, runs in the AV groove, the atrioventricular groove, that groove between the atria and the ventricles full of fat and blood vessels. And it basically runs forward and down and backwards. So it actually loops around the heart. You can see that. So this is coming forward, down, and then backwards. As it does that, it supplies branches to the atria and then the ventricles called marginals. These are called marginal arteries. And then as it goes down, 
it forms this posterior interventricular branch of the right coronary artery that then deviates off the branches which run through the septum. And so you can see these are the, the distributions of the right coronary and the left coronary artery. So you see the right coronary artery is right ventricle down to the inferior part of the septum, and then it actually supplies about the anterior third of the septum. In 60% of people, it supplies the sinoatrial node, so a pacemaker of the heart. And in over 80% of people, it also supplies the AV node. And this is important because if you actually occlude one of these vessels as a result of a heart attack or some other problem with your coronary arteries, you can actually cause conduction disturbances and these people can have what you call a heart block. And that can be a real problem. Then on its terminal run, what often happens with the right coronary artery is it comes and it forms an anastomosis with the terminal branches of the circuplex coronary artery around on the inferior border of the heart. Now, we use coronary angiography a lot in, in diagnosis and also in therapeutics as well. So essentially what you've got is this catheter, and in this person the catheter's been inserted in their radial artery, run right the way up, and they've actually stuck the catheter into the right coronary artery, which is just there, and then they've injected the dye, which then comes up black on an x-ray. And so you can see all of these structures. So this is the right coronary artery, and there you go, it's coming forward, oh, and it runs back and then down, then behind, and then giving off this branch here, giving off septals, and that's what's supplying the posterior aspect of the interventricular septum. And the other thing that you notice is this big branch at the start, that's going to the sinoatrial node there, and this little one down here is going to the AV node. And uh, that's actually a, that's actually a, a picture which has, has been laid, I laid that one to show you exactly where these branches these are your marginal branches over right here. So this is why this stuff's important, because this is everyday clinical practice. So the left coronary artery, which we usually refer to as the left main coronary artery, because it branches, and so to call it the left as opposed to the right doesn't really do it justice, arises again from the left sinus of Valsava, behind the pulmonary infundibulum, and it emerges from behind the oracle after this very short course, only about two and a half centimetres, it then divides into two branches, the continuation of it being the circumflex. So the circumflex is really just a continuation of the left main. It's like Mounts Bay Road turning into Stirling Highway. Uh, it's the same artery, just called something different. And this runs around in the same AV groove full of back and coronary vessels. It gives off obtuse marginal coronary arteries on the lateral wall of the heart and then it runs down and then it anastomoses with the terminal branches of the right coronary artery. In 40% of people it gives off a little branch in the early course of the circumflex which then runs behind the left atrium up into the sinoatrium node and that's very important when you're operating on the atrium because you can actually into that artery and you can take out the blood supply of the sinoatrium. Now, if you have Mounts Bay Road going to Stirling Highway, there must be a Thomas Road coming off somewhere. And that Thomas Road is called the anterior interventricular artery, otherwise known as the left anterior descending or LAD. So in clinical practice we call it the LAD, although it's nothing of the sort because, well, it's left, I guess, not anterior, and it's not descending. But if you hold a heart like you do in the lab, it is anterior and descending. So that's the reason why the name stuck. Now this emerges often at what looks like right angles. It runs down the interventricular septum, which is the reason why the technical name for it is the anterior interventricular artery. And it gives off these diagonal branches all the way down. And so this is supplying a large amount of the anterior wall of the heart, so the left and the right ventricles, as well as the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Then when it gets down to the end, it forms this little, almost like a snake tongue. It always bifurcates at the end. Down its course, it has septal perforators which come off at right angles. You can see that in the angiogram I'm about to show you. And what happens at the end is that it can sometimes wrap right the way around the septum. And so it can actually supply the inferior wall as well to varying degrees. 
Again, this is a coronary angiogram, so here's your catheter from the radial artery going into the left coronary artery or left main, you can see it's short. Now, in this particular angle, you don't get the impression that the circumflex, which is here, is actually a continuation, but it's just because of the angle of the shot. That's actually the continuation. Then gives rise to this big marginal branch down here, that's the obtuse marginal or marginal branch of the circumflex, supplying the lateral wall of the heart. And then the, the left anterior descending is this one coming down here, as you see when the knife builds it up. And that's going right the way down to the apex of the heart and where it there bifurcates. You can see septals coming off running in the interventricular septum, because remember this runs on the interventricular septum, it shows you where it is. And if I label it for you, there you go. So left main, continuing on as a circumflex. Anterior interventricular, or LAD. Septal perforators coming off, supplying the septum. And then this obtuse marginal coming off the circumflex. So this is running the AV route. Now there's actually a lot of variation in how they branch, but like fingerprints, they might be unique, but they all form patterns. And so one thing we refer to as dominance, and there are many ways of actually describing arterial dominance of the heart. Probably the easiest and the one that's used the most is based on which artery gives rise to that posterior interventricular artery. Now, it says different things in different books, and uh, Moore's anatomy says that 67% are right dominant, and it says that 15% uh, are left, and then 18 are both. I think that those numbers are wrong. I think that these numbers are much closer to the truth. But you can see these coronary angiograms here. So this is the right coronary artery here. You can see it goes nowhere. It supplies a very, very small part of the heart, certainly compared to the previous ones we've seen, as opposed to this left coronary artery, which you can see here, and here's the circumflex, giving off obtuse marginal branches. Now, notice the vessels are running in different places, but they're forming the same patterns. And then it comes right the way around the back, and then it gives off this little branch that you see down here, which is actually your posterior interventricular coronary artery, and you can see it's actually giving off little septals. So often we call this, this right coronary artery a recessive pattern because it's not really doing much. And it's not really doing much because the left coronary artery is where it was all at. Now why is this important? If a person blocks off their left main, it means that they've taken out the entire blood supply to their heart. You can imagine that that's not going to supply enough to supply a bit of the atrium and tiny bit of the ventricle on the right hand side. So that's very dangerous to have blockages up in your left main in this kind of anatomy. So just a couple of other variations. The most common we just discussed is your left dominant circulation. This is a picture of a heart which has a left dominant circulation. This is the left main around here, or just up there behind the auricle. That's the left anterior descending peak over here. This is a marginal going right the way down. It's a big marginal. And then come around so you can see that there's this groove, this interatrial groove. This is left ventricle, this is right ventricle, and you can see that end of the circumflex there, this coronary artery which comes <coughs> down and then feeds off these little branches into the septum. And so this is a left dominant coronary artery. <coughs> and the one thing you don't see, which you normally see, is you normally see the right coronary artery peeking around the corner going down. This is another really cool one. This is a trifurcating left main. So there's your left main. That's your left anterior interventricular branch there and diagonal. This is your circumflex going there, and there's the juice marginal, and you have this branch which runs right the way down the middle. Not really sure whether it wants to be an obtuse marginal or a diagonal. And so we call that a ramus intermedius. So that's Latin for the root of the tree, or the intermediate root. Because it kind of looks like the root of the tree, right? right? They're, they're anatomists. Other things you can have is these, your, uh, your LAD, or your left anterior interventricular and your circumflex can arise from the same part or from separate ostia, so separate little holes in the left. Or you can have a really cool one where they actually come from totally the wrong spot and they can actually come from another sinus. And uh, this is actually a coron this is an angiogram that the patient was operated on about two weeks ago where that's their right coronary artery there. You can see that there's this bridging artery here that then goes across, and there's the LAD going down there. So this is an anomalous left main. And you see, you follow the right, 
There's the PDA, you can see how that actually wraps right the way around the inferior surface onto the anterior or onto the sternocostal across the surface of the heart and actually does most of what the, what the anterior interventricular firing would normally do. You can see that on this other view, so, so there's, the, uh, there's the anterior interventricular branch right there, but most of it's actually being done by the right arm wrist. Now that's really dangerous. There's a risk of sudden death with this because this artery here usually courses between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And so if a person with this coronary variation goes and exercises, or if they drink lots of water, and they have a really high cardiac output, they can actually pinch off this vessel to the left side of their heart. And that's actually a cause of sudden death in athletes. So coronaries are pretty much end arteries, and anastomoses do occur, but they're pretty useless in acute ischemia. Um, they're usually the subendocardial vessels, 100 to 200 microns, and they're often through septals. And you can see this is an example of an anastomosis here, going down to from the left anterior root of the trichula down to down to the PDA down here. Um, they're only really important if someone has chronic ischemia. This is where the anatomy gets hard because every other time I've told you this is easy to remember: two cusps, two fingers, three cusps, three fingers. These these veins don't actually correspond to the arteries. There are three. So the coronary sinus we've discussed before, that's where about 85% of the blood drains back in. You have the venae cordis minimi, or the smallest cardiac veins, and these are all over the heart. They're just veins that go through the wall into the chambers of all four chambers, so atria and ventricles left and right, and anterior cardiac veins going directly into the RA and AV groove. Of the coronary sinus, there are five main branches. The most important being this great cardiac vein runs to the left of the left anterior interventricular, runs around, and this is really, really cool because if you think the blood's running that way, the circumflex is running that way, this is one of the only two times in the body that you'll see arterial and venous blood running in the same direction from an organ. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Um, you've got marginal veins, You've got the, uh, the middle cardiac vein, which runs alongside the PDA, the small cardiac vein, and this is my favourite here, just because it's obscure, and it's called the oblique vein of Marshall. And this is a remnant of the left superior vena cava in embryology. Look, I think we've covered all of those. Um, these are just some other resources that you may be interested in. So these are, these are the ones I used to put together this talk. These bold-faced ones, they're available in thoracic surgery clinics of North America. Really, really good for when you have to study for exams. It should be available on your uh, library website. Otherwise, it's easy enough to get hold of you. Um, it's, uh, you know, you, you can speak to Nathan and we'll be able to get you in touch. But these are really good review articles. So if you're interested, I encourage you to read them. And uh, with that, I'll ask if there are any questions. Thank you very much.